Hi guys, welcome to Design Technology TV. Today we're going to continue our series looking at NEA contact, content for OCR. And today we're going to specifically looking at assessing feasibility. So whilst this is strongly connected to 1.1, uh, the content within it are approaches rather than being directly linked to the content you're required to produce. So this is a more factual input about things you can do, ways to approach stuff and trying to get your project off to a good start, but there's no discussion about how that fits in with the NEA mark scheme or any other aspects. So within the previous video that you've just watched, or you should have watched, you'll have heard me talking about SWOT analysis. Now SWOT analysis is a popular way for people to undertake strengths, weaknesses, opportunity and threat analysis, i.e. looking at the project as a whole pulling together some ideas of what can be issues, what can be strengths of your project ideas, etc, etc. Now, importantly, uh, SWOT analysis is really good at doing a quick approach, and it's something I suggest that you do for each of your projects. We've talked about the fact that you're going to have three or more. So using SWOT analysis is a very quick way of delving into the problem, identifying the key aspects within it. However, SWOT analysis isn't the best. Um, SWOT analysis can be a little bit generic in terms of its responses. So, for instance, if a group of 30 students all produce SWOT analysis for three different projects each, the likelihood is that a huge number of those projects and a huge number of those SWOT analysis of them will come out with the same issues in terms of weaknesses, threats, quite often similar opportunities and, and strengths as well. So you need to bear in mind that this is a bit of a blunt tool. It's not particularly great at delving really into the deep uh, details of issues and because of that it's not necessarily the best and it's not something that I recommend that you use throughout so use it for your ideas but then you need to go into further detail particularly for the project you intend to follow so first of all we've got the SWOT um, so strengths what are the strengths of your idea is it does it have a USP so has it got a unique selling point why is it better than stuff that's already there so quite often when students embark on their project what they'll do is they'll find projects or products that already exist and the issue is do you then really have a strength uh, is it better than what's already out there are you tailoring your design so it is for a specific user or a specific environment or a specific specific context of use are your stakeholders going to look at that and go wow that's awesome I want to buy it because that's where you need to be heading the converse of that is true as well so what are the weaknesses if there's if you decided you want to produce a product maybe some kind of um, leg brace for instance and then you look at it and then the exact leg brace that you're talking about designing for motocross already exists it's already really good it's got really good reviews on the uh, internet it does everything you are hoping to do then you've got to question whether you've really got a product so is it the competition already producing something that's way better than what you're doing um if that's the case can you improve your idea you know can you make it stronger the other thing to look at in terms of weaknesses also then is your stakeholders. What do they perceive as your weaknesses, i.e. what are the things you're not doing very well? The best way to do that is engage with conversations with people within your group uh, or your user, uh, or if you've got a key stakeholder that you've already engaged, talk to them about it. Quite often with this area, students come up quite short and they're a little bit weak because what they don't do is they don't ask other people. They just do it as their own perception. So you say, yeah, my project's really strong because of X. There aren't really any weaknesses. It's fine. But what actually happens in reality is that there are some really significant weaknesses that are fundamental to the product and they haven't organized or recognized them. And then that means that further down the project, they become a real issue because there's something that once you've moved further along the line, if you haven't already identified that as being a problem, it can be something that comes back to bite you. So opportunities. Um, how can you make sure that your product is, is positive? Can you make sure that it meets upcoming trends? So maybe there's opportunities in fashion or there's opportunities uh, in the area that you're looking at. And that might be, for instance, it could be there's an opportunity for the fact that there is a real need for affordable housing. If you're doing uh, an an architectural project it might be that you can see the fact that young buyers are struggling to get onto the market because everything is out of their price range what can you do there's an opportunity there so what are the opportunities and if you're looking at trends and factual data you can obviously often forecast what's coming ahead and then you can address those bits um, 
are there opportunities within your project to come about it a different ways? Can you do things differently? Can you, if something doesn't work, can you go about it a different way and still get to a successful outcome? We then got threats, which are kind of basically the opposite of opportunities. Um, what conditions might be bad, i.e. has somebody already got something on the market that's either there already or that he's already have a strong placement? Is it that you're trying to compete against somebody that has been doing it for years and has all the technology? Is it that um, there, there's legislation, i.e. governmental rules or other aspects which are in place which would stop you from doing what you need to do? There's a couple of other bits that I've popped on the bottom of this slide. They're not part of SWOT analysis normally. U and M don't fit with SWOT. Um, however, something you should be considering if you're doing a SWOT analysis, even if it is a light touch, is your user. Who are they? Uh, what do they want from the project? And marketability. Can you show that you are solving a problem? Is there really a gap in the market for your product? Uh, as we talked about, stitching together proof from other sources is really important. If you see the previous video on that, you'll see... Uh, as in 1.1 on the NEA, you'll see that we cover that. So moving on from there, task analysis. So we've looked at SWOT analysis, which is ideal for looking at your projects as a whole. Task analysis is then looking at what it is that you actually need to do. Sometimes and most often what you'll find is that students dip in and out of each of these. So none of these are, are absolutely assured in terms of where you must go. There aren't any rules, but you can use this to help start you off. So you can break it down in terms of the titles, which are across the top. So we've got function, anthropometrics and ergonomics, materials, manufacturer, fixings, components and key stakeholders. Each of those then open up options for you to look into in more detail. Things that you should know and should find out information. You'll notice in the top right hand corner, it says highlight areas where knowledge is lacking. So it might be that currently you don't know something. So, for instance, it might be that you're designing something for a child uh, and that they've gone to wear it, but you don't know how big the child is. So you'd have to look into that. So the ergonomics and anthropometrics of a child at a given stage of their growth and their age will be in, in, instrumental in terms of you having a successful product. What happens quite often is that students don't recognize the areas they don't know. They plow in, they pretend that stuff will be fine or just skip over areas rather than actually tackling them. Then later on, we get towards the sort of end of the design process and then the teacher will say, so have you thought about how big this thing is? And even though they've gone all the way through the process, they've designed all sorts of complex aspects, they've looked at various things, they've never really considered something as simple and basic as the size. And then the whole thing has to be redesigned because it's suddenly completely way too big or way too small. Equally, there are other things. So for instance, manufacturing materials that might impact on how you can go about it. So you might have a way that's really great at solving or resolving a problem. But what actually happens if you look at it, the material you've chosen, really difficult to manufacture, really expensive, and it's going to make your product incredibly expensive to, to produce. Because of that, that's then going to impact on its marketability, because if it's way overpriced, then people won't buy it. So within this, there's a whole load of aspects uh, that you should be considering. And you can use this to break it down, and you can almost use these as subheadings and start looking at each of them. Some of them may not be appropriate for your product, but it's quite useful to do so. You'll also notice down the bottom, we then have next steps to take. Within the NEA, it talks frequently about students setting their next steps and understanding what they're going to do. It's really important that you understand how to make process and what needs to happen. We've got everything from next steps to short-term priorities, key dates, and then critical factors for success. So next steps to take. First of all, are there gaps in your knowledge? Are there dependencies? What's a dependency? So a dependency is something where something relies on something else to happen. So for instance, if you were trying to speak to someone uh, as a specialist stakeholder, a first dependency would be to identify who they are. The next would then be to contact them. Without those two things, you're not just going to bump into them and talk to them and discuss your project with them. So that's kind of an obvious and basic one. Um, but there are other design dependencies where you have to design a certain component part first before you can produce the next bit. Time frame. The time frame for St. Brendan students is that it will be in by mid-March of the following year. So that's okay to understand and quite often having key dates in place is useful. However, within the key dates, sometimes they are quite long time frames, one, two months perhaps. That makes it quite difficult for students to actually understand where they are within that space. And, and because you, it's the first time you're going through it, you're not necessarily very good at organizing yourself within that better way of doing it is to setting short-term priorities daily weekly couple of weeks at most what needs to happen within that time frame to allow you to pr 
progress your projects and move forwards. Key dates, as I've just talked about, they're things that your teacher will likely set and will be for mine. And then critical factors for success. What is it that you need to do? What things have to happen? So it might be that at the moment you set down a project where you're going to undertake the design of a foldable bicycle helmet. It's a solid project. It's got lots going on for it. It's a really good NEA project. However, within it, particularly if you're a student who's expecting to use CAD CAM and use computer aided manufacture to help you manufacture such a complicated shape, you may at the moment be in a position where one of the um, critical factors of success is that you actually need to learn how to 3D model better using SOLIDWORKS or another system. If that's the case, then that model be something that is a critical factor for success and something you, if you identify early and work on early, it means that when the 3D design comes in, you'll have already practiced, you'll have played with ideas, you'll have learned stuff from YouTube, and it'll put you in a position that you're actually able to carry or move forwards and carry on and produce a good quality project. Holistic analysis. So this comprises quite a few aspects of the previous sections, and it's something which I see routinely uh, used by my students. The factors, quite a few of them are very similar. We've got things where we've got the proposed budget, we've got the key factors for success. What does it need to do? How important are those factors out of 100? So rating them, that ranking can be very useful to help uh, you to understand what the most important bits. So sometimes there's factors that are very useful, but they're not actually as important as others. We've got looking at strengths and weaknesses again, we've got opportunities, threats, we've also got key local issues. So that comes down to your abilities, such as the 3D modeling that I was talking about, but they also might be something where you're designing something and you want to make it and manufacture it in a certain way. However, those manufacturing possibilities are just not available to you, i.e. your workshop isn't equipped with the machinery and the stuff that you need to do. That's something you should hopefully identify sooner rather than later because it stops you going down a dead end. Equally, it's something you can discuss with your teacher. So for instance, since Brendan's students will routinely chat to myself and what we'll do is we'll discuss opportunities to take it somewhere else, either by changing the design or just by supplementing something else or, or changing something around because that then makes it work. We then got time frame again with short term priorities. We've got gaps in your knowledge and then we've got key dates that you meet over the project. There's also some information on the right hand side column, which is looking at the user. Um, we'll talk more about user focus when we get to the design brief and user, which is 1.2, which is the next video after this one. But fundamentally, you have to have a user. You need to know who they are. And there's a variety of questions there that will help you to identify who they are, why they're right for your project, how they're going to help you out. The last bit here is user centered design. And now this in itself is not necessarily feasibility analysis, but it is linked in with it. So you'll notice that the first stages, stage one particularly, are identifying the stakeholders, working out what the considerations are, how you're going to manufacture it, retail it, what sort of things you need to know. That's very closely linked in with the sections we've just discussed. However, moving on from that is more of a way of you move using uh, UCD or user-centered design as you work your way through your project. So this is something you'll probably come back to. It might be something you set in place at the start and then you go work your way through. Now, importantly for this, students who undertake this and do it well often come out with the best projects because what they're doing is they're using information and they're using other people's feedback and guidance to help them work their way through. That in itself marries very nicely in with a series of aspects within the MART scheme. It also means that they're not trying to find out information themselves, which a user or a specialist client could just go, it's that. So they're not they're saving themselves time. Equally, it stops them from going down an alleyway where they design something, go, yeah, I love this. They take it to a user eventually, and the user goes, no, nah, rubbish. It won't do this because it doesn't meet this, this, or this. So straight away, what you're doing is by involving your user regularly, it helps you to work your way through the problem. So there's a series of sections here. So stage one is working out who the people are, particularly your primary user, and the people you want to speak to. Stage two is then contacting them and organizing stuff. Importantly with that, um, it's worth speaking to your teacher if you don't know these people as a family friend or through your family directly and you're contacting outside agencies or people um, you need to consider what risk there is so make sure you're not putting yourself in any risk by going and meeting people uh, where you don't know necessarily who they are or where what you know, office setting or what you're getting yourself into so do a bit of risk assessment as well um, don't fall foul of that and just speak to your teacher or email your teacher if you've got any concerns it's an important one to get right stage three 
uh, understanding the user requirements, what do they need? Now this might happen right at the very start of the project and we will be discussing this in the next video. So although it's stage three, we're right on that already. And then what you do is you work your way through understanding what they want, whether they're gonna buy instead of something else, what they see as the key requirements, what do they see as desirable, but not necessarily essential, etc., etc. And then we get on to stage four and stage four is almost like a rinse repeat. So you're going through a cycle where it's repeatedly over and over again, as you iterate your way through your design, what you're doing is you're using the five feedback from your user, you're refining your details as you go, and you're making your product better and better with the period of the design process. So after this video, you should be watching 1.2, Design Brief and User. Thank you very much for your time. Subscribe, click like, Design Technology TV. Thank you.